we are working through Pentecost, but that's not the class, that's not the lesson. The calendar is Pentecost. Our lessons are coming out of uh, the Old Testament. We're looking for old familiar Bible stories, Sunday school stories. And we've just finished the three patriarchs. We just finished the story of, of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who's singing? Anyway, um, and the Jacob story ends with where the Joseph story picks up. Jacob has done his job. He, his job was to create a people. He created 12 uh, sons from four different women. And the people of Israel are starting but the story is a complex one, and Joseph is the second to the last of these children. He is the favorite of the father, Jacob, and he draws the animosity of his other brothers, and he is sold into slavery. This is where we ended last week. It turns out because Joseph trusts God that he sees the work of God's hand in everything. So his brothers, you know, it could have been, probably was a terrifying thing to go through and then be sold into slavery. You don't know what's going to happen, but you trust God that he has a plan and it's going to work out. Joseph finds himself a slave in the in Potiphar's household. Potiphar is a rich and powerful man, one of the ministers of the court. So he has the ear of, of uh, Pharaoh. But this is where we actually ended last week. Potiphar has a wife who had designs on Joseph. Joseph is described in the scripture as being very handsome. He's a tall man, he's very handsome. And the wife of Potiphar tries to seduce Joseph. Joseph is, a, is our hero. He's not gonna give in to that kind of temptation. He doesn't give in. And as he tries to leave her presence, she reaches out and grabs his outer garment. It says garment, but it's unlikely that he was fully naked. It would, probably would have said so. He basically runs out in his underclothes. He runs, runs from the place. Now, she's got to figure out what to do. She's, she's standing there holding his outer garment Probably somebody has seen this guy run across the courtyard in his underwear. So she tells a lie. She tells the opposite of what happened. He came after her. He accosted her. Um, see, I've got his clothes in my hand. He was undressing, trying to get to me. If I hadn't screamed, it would have, uh, you know, who knows? Anyway, that's the story she tells. Who's gonna believe Joseph? He's just a slave, Potiphar's wife. She's got all the power. So Joseph ends up in prison. Let me remind myself where I am in Genesis. Um, we're in, in uh, Genesis chapter 40. I'll bet Potiphar was sorry. Well, that's what my commentator said. I, I haven't done a lot of study here, but Potiphar probably knows his wife. Jo Joseph had made Potiphar, Joseph had made Potiphar rich. He owed Joseph a lot, but he had to deal with this 
spouse. So you're right, Tim. He, he... Now, going to jail is, it, it's an odd situation. Joseph is able to thrive even in jail. He becomes the assistant to the warden. It's not what they, exactly what they call him, but Joseph is just the kind of guy that knows how to do stuff. I, and, and, he, and, it, and, it, and he's recognized by people in power. So the warden uh, elevates Joseph because he's a good guy and can get things done in the, in the prison. Now, obviously his circumstances are a lot lower now, but Joseph doesn't seem to care. He, he does a good job wherever he is and he gives God the credit. That's, that's our hero, okay? So far, so good. Now, what happens in prison? You remember your Bible stories? We have the first of the dream accounts. There's two other people in prison. At the same time, Joseph goes to prison. They are known as the butler and the baker. They are both servants <clears throat> of, of uh, uh, Pharaoh. So now notice we've, we've got a window in to Pharaoh's court, okay? But we're down here in prison, so it's, a, it's problematic. But anyway, <clears throat> we don't know exactly what, uh, what the butler and the baker did to find themselves in prison, but they are both in prison. And they have each a dream. Um, the, uh, I want to, I want to look at the two dreams because I, I uh, the, the two dreams are going to have very similar, we've got to go to, we've got to go to Genesis 40. Okay. Here it is. The butler is also known as the cupbearer. Um, they, have, they each have a dream. Here, here, here we go. We both have, I'm trying to find the dreams. Okay, here's the cupbearer's dream, the butler. He said to him, I saw a vine in front of me and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup. I want to be sure that the, I'm doing something correct here. Um, That way the recording will be picking up the Bible. Okay, that's the dream number one. Um, the butler sees him giving a cup of fresh wine to Pharaoh. Joseph is able to interpret it. Theological, the spiritual understanding here is God gave the dreams to the two men. And he gave the ability to understand the dreams to Joseph. And that's all so the right people get impressed here in this story. It hasn't happened yet, but eventually we're gonna get Joseph into Pharaoh's court. That's important part of this. We're still down in the lower workings of the, of the process. Anyway, What does it mean? Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do. But when all goes well with you, remember me 
and show me kindness, mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison, for I was forcefully carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put into a dungeon. So Pharaoh, I mean, not Pharaoh, uh, Joseph makes a request. I've given you some good information. Help me out. When the chief baker, that's the other character now, uh, saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Does that sound all that bad? The birds eating the bread for Pharaoh probably is your clue, right? You don't like birds. No. no. This, birds in the Bible yeah. are generally bad. This is what it means. The, th the three baskets. It's a biblical interpretation thing. Uh, the three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh. Okay, there's your two, there's your two dreams. Joseph has given one guy a good interpretation. They're going to be back in Pharaoh's court. Everything's fine. The other guy says... The death penalty is, is going to be applied to you. You're going to end up being food for, for uh, buzz, buzzards. Now, no, he didn't. He figured that. He figured that. There's no, no sense asking that guy anything. Okay. Pharaoh's birthday is three days later. He gave a feast. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer. Okay. He get, moves him up to court. And the chief baker, chief baker in the presence of the officials, he restored the cupbearer, but he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had said in his interpretation. And now, just a little note, the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. So Joseph's appeal, to, you know, when you're up there, to tell, tell Pharaoh how 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 my interpretations went. Okay. How would you feel? Especially when notice the next line. Two years pass. You're in a well now remember, he's still got a good job. He's he's still the assistant of the warden. So he's he's not in a terrible situation, but could be a lot better. Now Pharaoh has a dream. Here comes the other set of dreams. He was standing by the Nile, and out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat. They grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. Just, just to test your Sunday school days. Do you all remember the interpretation of that? I think yeah. that, I think I think that's one that sticks with us, right? Seven years of plenty will be followed by seven years of famine, and that and that's the that's the interpretation that Joseph is going to use to impress Pharaoh. But anyway, this is a very familiar Bible story for us. Okay. He fell asleep again. There's a second dream, but it's got the same story. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy heads. I don't know how heads of grain swallow other heads of grain, but it doesn't matter. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. Yeah, but, but okay, but the point is those two dreams are, this, are this really the same dream, and Joseph is going to say exactly that to Pharaoh. In the morning, his mind was troubled, so he sent for his magicians and other wise men. See, we're, we're just regular folks. We, we know the interpretation of the seven good years and seven bad years, but his wise men didn't know that. Of course, we've got the benefit of the Bible. 
But anyway, Chief Cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imprisoned me. Each of us had a dream. Now a young Hebrew was there. So finally, the, the cupbearer is giving to Pharaoh the information that Joseph had hoped would get him out of prison. We told him our dreams. He interpreted them. And things turned out exactly as, as he had suggested. One man was raised up. The other was hanged. Okay. So here we go. Pharaoh sends for Joseph. He was quickly brought. He had, they had to clean him up. He'd been, he's been living in a dungeon. So he had to be shaved. He had got a new set of clothes. So he arrives. Pharaoh tells him about the dream. And Pharaoh, Joseph says something to Pharaoh that um, would... Uh, I think is a brave thing to say. Pharaoh says to Joseph, I hear you can interpret dreams. And Joseph says, no, it's not me. It's my God that is interpreting the dreams. That's a, that's a brave way to react. You, you would, you, a selfish person would say, you're right. I, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm good at, I'm good at this. Yes, you should reward me. Okay, anyway. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer. Uh, apparently, Pharaoh understands. There were a lot of religions that had God, so it was probably not unusual for someone to, to talk about God in the presence of Pharaoh. It didn't bother him either way. Anyway, uh, he, tells, he tells Joseph the dream. Um, but the dream gets a little bit more expanded. The, the first time we read it in the Bible, there's a few missing pieces. Notice this time. Uh, it's just some things that he didn't say the first time, which he's saying to Joseph. I, I, I don't know what we can interpret from this other than than his mind maybe is a little clearer this time i had never seen such ugly cows in all the land of egypt and then this one after the ugly cows ate the beautiful cows they couldn't, they didn't look any different. They were still gaunt. They were still ugly. That, that line wasn't in the original thing. Um, I guess I could say that that, that that just means that the the seven bad years are going to be all the all the worse. But anyway, then he then he goes through the heads of grain. And he tells Joseph, my magicians couldn't tell me what's going on. Here's, here's Joseph explaining to Pharaoh what's going on. The two dreams, he says, are the same dream. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven years are seven good years. Seven lean and ugly cows are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. Uh, <laughs> Joseph then tells Pharaoh something that he wasn't asked to do. He gives Pharaoh advice. What you should do is put knowledgeable people in charge of the situation so that you can get through this seven years of abundance and seven years of, of and that, that's good advice. He, he, I don't know if Joseph expected it, but Pharaoh says, you're right and you're it. So let's see, how does this go? Um, 
Joseph is still talking. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years. Notice, this is a tax. Joseph has just recommended a 20% tax. You could also call it a tithe. A 20% tax. It is for that period of time. Actually, 10% was the norm. So this was doubling taxes to, to raise up an abundance. Now, I, I know we're going to, no, we have, we have plenty of time, but I was surprised when I reread the story. You know, I, I picture the granaries all full. How did you think the grain came out of the granaries? Who's ringing? Is that you? Oh, okay. I just, okay. Okay. It, it, it never occurred to me. I just figured they gave the food to the people. Yeah. No. Pharaoh sold the food to the people. When they ran out of money, what did they do? Mortgage their farms. Pharaoh becomes extremely wealthy by this scheme. He takes over all the money, all the land in the, in the, in the area of Egypt as a result of, of Joseph. So I've, I just always thought it was, I, I, I understand the 20% tax part. So the people paid taxes to put the food in the granary, and then they paid again to get the food out. I just thought that was an interesting. Uh, well, it was not as clean as I had remembered it. I don't remember my Bible teacher telling me about that stuff. Anyway, uh, the food should be held in reserve so that the famine will not ruin us. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. Can we find anyone like this man? One whom is the spirit of God, in whom is the spirit of God. So according to this line, Pharaoh is recognizing that the power of God is, is in Pharaoh. I mean, I mean in, in Joseph. Since God has made all this known to you, there's no one so can dis discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace. All my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Joseph has just been moved up to number two in the kingdom of Egypt. He's the second person in power. The, the emperor, the, the pharaoh is not giving him his throne, so he's still the pharaoh. But other than that, put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. He even gave his ring, that's power, gave his ring, put a gold chain around his neck. They put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all of Egypt. He gives him wives. Joseph, uh, uh, I can't even say that, Zaphonath, Pania, and another one. So he, he gets... He gets two women to be wives. Joseph is 30 years old. He's now the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. I would say that's pretty well positioned to take care of what's about to happen next. The people. That's right. He started. That's right. He is big. <laughs> so throw it into his okay. Well, actually, and this is this story is interesting because it goes up and down. Yeah. He goes from the cistern to Potiphar, right. then back into prison, back into and then now all the way, years. now the way for for years. So um, the seven years of abundance happen. Uh, this is being described. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Joseph amasses an, a, a great amount of resources, grain, to survive. Two, he has children. Two sons were born. Um, these are important names uh, later on, so just note them. 
Manasseh and Ephraim are two famous Hebrew names. When the people of Israel divide up the, the, the land after the Exodus, after the Exodus, we haven't gotten there yet. These two are sub-tribes. Joseph's tribe is divided into two. And these names are going to be property owners in, in the new uh, divided Canaan. Did they have Egyptians? Well, technically, yes. But God looks past that. The, the birthright goes through Joseph to his sons. Jacob. Joseph, and then Manasseh and Ephraim are is the is the line. It uh, okay. Okay, uh, here here we start the famine. Okay, seven good years, seven bad years. So now, the famine begins, just as Joseph had said. The whole land of Egypt, there was enough food because they they had been saving up all this. People began to feel the famine. And what did Pharaoh say? Well, go to eat, go to Joseph. He's got all the food. So they went to Joseph and do, and here, here, here's, here's how, when the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened the storehouses. That's the part I remember. Opened yeah. the storehouses. Like he was do doling out the food. <laughs> but look at the next sentence or next clause. And sold grain to the Egyptians. I'd, I'd missed that part. <laughs> and all the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe. Now we get to the next part of the story. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, so the, the famine also included the land of Canaan where Jacob and his family were. I've heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Now, sons of Jacob have no idea about Joseph. They're oblivious to what's about to happen. They just know they need to go down to Egypt because that's where the food is. So they're going to go. Ten of Joseph's... Yeah, well, they, they, yeah, they, they sold him into slavery. They, they, they just assumed the worst, probably. Yeah. Now, it does say 10, Joseph, 10 of Joseph's brothers. So if you count, keep a count in your head, why isn't it 11? Well, Benjamin is the youngest son, and, and Jacob was very careful with the youngest son, who was the last son of Rachel. Rachel gave birth to Joseph. And and uh, and Benjamin, yeah, thank you. So since Joseph is supposedly dead, they are very careful about what happens to Benjamin. So they don't send him to Egypt. They just send the ten older boys, the ones they don't really care about, down <laughs> down down to Egypt. Uh, okay. So Joseph is the one who sells the grain. So. It's inevitable if he really is the one, actually the, the administrator, you have to deal with, I would think there would be underlings and subordinates and you would never really see Joseph. But anyway, so when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him. So the way the story is going, he's standing there at the, at the counter when they come up to buy grain. He says, ha, 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 I got him. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to, to them. So he's beginning to play out a little bit of a story here. He wants to see what, what he can learn and what he can do. They bowed down. They bowed down, right, yeah. Now it's probably not hard to understand they look like Hebrews. They look like country folk. He was dressed and groomed like an Egyptian. So, so they, they would not have recognized him. He spoke Egyptian. He had, he had been there for however many years now. In the, well, I don't know. 
in the 15 years, 15, 10 or 15 years. So he, he looked Egyptian. He, he, it would not have been easy for the brothers to figure out who this was. So they explain that they're from the land of Canaan and uh, they're there to buy food. Um, Joseph plays with them a little bit, accuses them of being spies. No, we're not spies. We just, we're hungry. We need, we need food. Joseph continues. No, you're spying. You're, you just want to see where our, how our land is laid out, how our defenses are laid out. And then they make, then they make a mistake. And, um, there's no explanation for why this opened up this way, but they replied to, to Joseph, your servants were 12 brothers. Now that's true. They were originally 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. So now they've explained the math, why 12 minus two is 10, but they have told Joseph, that there were two other brothers. One is no more. Joseph knows who that is, it's him. But, the, but Benjamin is with their father. You're a spies. Go get your brother. The rest of you will stay in prison. And uh, he's, he's I guess he knows he's not going to do anything to them, but he's trying to scare them, get them to realize the gravity of their situation. He has the power to do this. So they, they, he holds them in custody for three days. No, he, he's toying, he's toying with his brothers. Now, the story ends up being a good, positive one. They have reconciliation. He is getting revenge. But, but he, is, he is making them sweat because he has the power to make them sweat. So, yeah, that's right. He's, this is not his best moment. But on the other hand, he's not hurting them. He's just scaring them. He has the power to put them all in prison. He holds them for three days, but not in a prison, in a suite. They get... They get fed and bathed, and it's 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 not bad. Uh, the, the the brothers are going over the story amongst themselves, uh, but while they're talking Hebrew with each other, they don't realize that Joseph can understand what they're saying. So this is another example where Joseph is not in his best situation. He's, he's, he's taking advantage. Um, so the story goes that the, uh, the brothers um, are gonna return to Jacob. He gives them the grain they wanted, but he keeps one of the brothers as the hostage so that you will come back I, I want you to come back i want you to come back with your with your brother and then he does something else he put each man's money in the sack of grain that he had purchased making it look like they had stolen the grain Although if you had stolen the grain, why, why would you put your money in the grain sack? I, I don't know that that's a good picture, but that's what, that's what Joseph does. He conspires so that, that when the guys open their grain sack, they're going to see their money. And they realize now, now they're also guilty of stealing, of stealing grain from Pharaoh. Okay. They, they learn this when they stop at night they were going to reach into the one the bag and give their donkey a little bit of food and that's when they discovered that they had money in their sacks my money has been returned here's my sack each one said the same thing 
What is this that God has done? When they came to their father, Jacob, they try to explain what's going on here. One of their brothers is in being held hostage. They've got this money problem with the grain. It's, it's, it's a very complex picture. Um, bring your youngest brother to me. And that's, that's gonna, Jacob cannot agree to that. He's, he's literally being asked to trade one son for the other, but he already knows what, who his favorite is. Joseph knew perfectly well that that was his favorite. Yes. So, so he, he's, he's, gonna, he's not going to give in. Jacob just can't say, okay, you can take Benjamin down so Simon or Simeon, whatever it is, can, will be let out. Um, Jacob would just say, well, tough on Simeon. Um, okay. Reuben, Reuben is the oldest. He's the firstborn of the 12. He tells Jacob, trust me, I will make this right. Um, you may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him back. And trust me. Um, let's see. Initially, I, I can't find it, but initially Jacob says, no, I'm, I'm not going to go through with it. But in, in chapter 43, the famine is so severe that they reach a second time that they've got to go buy food. So Jacob resists the first time, but now he's got to send sons down, go back and buy us a little more food. The man warned us solemnly, you can't come back without the little brother. Um, Israel, uh, Jacob then does, does ask, how does he even know about Benjamin? And then, so they had, they had to admit that they had let that little story out of the bag. They didn't necessarily intend to, but, but th that's done. Of course, Joseph did know about Benjamin, but they, they don't know he's Joseph. We simply answered his questions. Send the boy along with me. I'll guarantee his safety. I will bear, bear the blame my whole life. So Jacob agrees to send Benjamin. He also sends twice the money. Remember the stolen money from before? So he sends double money. He sends Benjamin and he sends gifts. Uh, what does it say about the gifts? Put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift. Balm, a little balm and honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the amount of the silver. Anyway, so they, they do go back with this entourage of, and gifts. Okay, I don't know how... The story, I'm not going to go verse by verse. The brothers come back now to, to, the, to Joseph and say, we need to buy more grain. They admit about the money, the double money. So here's my double money. Our father has sent gifts. Here's, our, here's Benjamin. Joseph tries to maintain the charade a little bit longer but he finally breaks down and can't. He gives in and tells the brothers um, what's going on. They are so angry at him that they rise up and kill him. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, the story could have gone in that way, but um, they, they are, they, they, this is a story of reconciliation, actually. Joseph, uh, 
Joseph concedes that he's been playing with them. Um, they, they, at first, actually don't know if they can believe him. He, he's able to prove, make proofs that, that he actually is Joseph. They, they believe, they, they come to believe that. So now that, now that they believe he's Joseph, can they really believe he has forgiven them? Wouldn't you be a little bit on tiptoes? Because this guy's obviously got a lot of power. He, if he decides to cut our heads off, nothing's going to stop us. Maybe if he had given into the plan of life, that here's your brain, they would have respected him and realized the power. I don't, I don't, I don't know. But, 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 but Joseph, what Joseph does is says, he, he turns it around. He says, you, you guys meant to do me harm. You, you, you tried to hurt me. But it was all God's plan. God did it for good. You meant to hurt me. But in every step I've taken, I've gotten to this position. God wants me here. So you only played a part in God's plan. That's how he deflects their worry that they are going to somehow suffer in all this. So the reconciliation happens. He gives God the credit. God did all of this. The whole thing was God's plan. And so now to finish that, the people of Israel need to come down to Egypt. And you've heard the name Goshen. The land of Goshen, that's, that's an area in Egypt. The land of Goshen was given to the Israelites by Pharaoh because Pharaoh liked Joseph. So Joseph is able to invite his whole family down. Jacob comes down and lives in the land of Goshen um, because Pharaoh makes it possible. Pharaoh provides at least the seed money. I don't know how this works, but because, because the folks coming down from Canaan are good shepherds, they, there's, there's a large abundance of animals and crops. And, and uh, so this is the beginning of the multiplication of the people of Israel. The land of Goshen is a good area in Egypt, very productive, produces lots of grain and animals. The people of, e of, of Israel become wealthy. Pharaoh, I'm sorry, uh, Joseph eventually dies and, and um, the um, bones of Joseph, uh, he has his sons promised to uh, eventually the people, he, he Joseph prophesies, eventually the people of Egypt, I mean, the people of Israel are going to leave Egypt. Take me with you when you go, okay? This is 400 years. 400 years later, but, but okay. Now, Jacob, uh, just to finish that little bit of a story, Jacob also dies in Goshen. But um, he wants to be buried immediately back up in Canaan where his family gets buried. Remember, Abraham and Sarah are all buried in that grave. So Joseph goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's got a lot of power and says, I, I, need, a, I, need, a, I need some time off. I need to take my family and we're going to have a funeral. Pharaoh says, fine, I'll give you whatever you need. So they arrange the escort, the transportation. So the family of Israel, if this is the right way, to, yeah. Jacob and his family are temporarily moved up to Canaan so they can bury uh, Jacob. Um, and Pharaoh arranges all that. So see, at, the point, at this moment, Joseph and Pharaoh are, are good butts because Joseph has made Pharaoh extremely wealthy. But then the story shifts. The way the Bible does it, I can't remember if it's 
it's, it's either the end of Genesis or the beginning of Exodus. I think it's the beginning of Exodus. It simply says, a new Pharaoh came into Egypt and didn't know Joseph. So that's when the story changes. Now that the Israelites are in Egypt, they are very wealthy and the people are jealous. In fact, Pharaoh is jealous. Why should these foreigners have all this? And the slavery begins. Why would they scared to being outnumbered? There, there might have been a little bit of ethnic. Uh, yeah, uh, well, in fact, that was definitely that's right on the money, Tim. Because remember, remember the Moses story begins with that terrible edict by Pharaoh that all boys be killed. Yeah. That that's a that's an ethnic cleansing thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. I did short circuit the Joseph story a little bit. There's a lot in there. You can read four or five chapters of Genesis um, to see the details, but uh, we are ready to begin Moses. And Moses would take us a lot. The whole book of Exodus and Numbers, for example. So that's not how we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it like I did Joseph today. I'm gonna tell stories and I'm going to find, Pardon? The highlight reel. Well, yeah, kind of. And then uh, if, we, if we need to, we'll find specific paragraphs where we need to look at something. But so um, I think you're familiar with the Moses stories, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I do not intend to let this drag out forever, but I realize that Moses is a big story, kind of like Abraham. It took us over a month to get through Abraham. So I'm not, I don't know exactly how long Moses is going to take. Moses sent his stiff-necked people. Oh yes, stiff-necked. Stiff people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah, slipped yeah, I... with a draft on their neck. That's right, that's right. Just had, we were just uncomfortable sleeping arrangements. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Okay, let's, uh, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Anything else for the good of the cause, folks? Thank you for your teaching today, Doug. That was great. Thank you, Bill. See you next week. Have a blessed um, week, everyone. Bye now. Oh, uh, Pat's saying she's going to be in Virginia. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to close the meeting since nobody's...